Hello, it's Keith here, and this is the fourth in the Chibi Akamas series of my Z80 tutorials. Now in this series we've been looking at the Chibi Akamas game that I wrote, and I've been discussing how it works and we've been looking at the source code. Last week we had a look at how to do some sprites, and in the past we've looked at how the objects move around the screen and how the screen coordinates work. This week we're going to be looking at what's known as the Star Array, and this handles the bullets within the game, and also the particle effects of the V9K version. So, how does it work? Well, the first thing to understand about the Star Array is the memory that it uses. Now, the enemy Star Array has up to 256 elements. The player Star Array has, only has 128. And the structure of the data is actually slightly odd. Now, if you think of an 8-bit machine with a 16-bit address bus, you have a HL pair of two bytes which make up the address. And the way the Star Array is structured is so that L will always be the number of the star in the array, and H will be offset to select the different elements of that array. So if we wanted star 3, we would set L to, th to 3. And then if we wanted Y, we would set the H offset to 0. X, we would set it to 1. And to get the move that the star is going to make, we would set it to 2. And this allows us to quickly switch to the array to seek for the next living object by scanning the Y coordinates. Because of a Y coordinate of 0 means the star isn't alive. And then if we want to get to the X coordinate, we just increase H. And then if we want to get to the move, we just increase H again. So this allows us a very simple way of scanning through the memory that makes up the star array to find the data on the stars as we process them. But this does mean that the memory is slightly oddly structured. Now, because the star array is split into 256 byte chunks, the first three chunks of the memory that the game uses for its objects and bullets are made up of the enemy star array, and you can see them in here yellow. However, the player star array is half the size, but because of the limitation of it always using the top byte of the address as the data type and the bottom byte as being the star number, we're still using 128 bytes, and that means that these bytes are actually spare. But these are used by the object array, which we'll be looking at in a later lesson. And so this gives us this rather odd structure where the second half of each 256 here is used by the stars, the first half is used by the object array, and then there's this spare bit here, which is used by what's known as the saved settings. And this allows the pre-definition of enemies to be quickly used within the game level. And again, it's going to be something we're going to look at in a later lesson. So now we know a little bit about the structure of the memory that the Star Array uses. So let's have a look at the source code of how the Star Array actually gets the bullets onto the screen. Now the first very important thing to understand is, although the game has three kinds of Star Array, particles on the V9K, which don't do anything, uh, bullets of the player, which only hurt the enemies, and enemy bullets, which only hurt the player, they're all drawn by the same routine. And this was a memory thing because the code is almost identical, so having three versions just didn't make sense. But that does mean we have a lot of reconfiguration code for reconfiguring self-modifying code with regards to collision detection, and also the colour of the objects, depending on the system. Also, the code can be quite different in places on each of the systems because the bullets are bigger on the Spectrum and on the MSX they're using sprites and on the CPC they're using hard-coded data which actually modifies the byte data of the screen. There's no sprites as such on the Amstrad CPC version. So it's going to be a little bit tricky today but we'll have a look and we'll try and discuss through what the modules do and hopefully you'll have an understanding of how this code works. The important thing to understand is the code had to be very fast because there's 255 bullets on screen for the enemy and another 128 for the player so the code was optimized for speed at all times to the extent of my ability. Okay, so let's take a look. Well, the first thing you can see here is we've got a particle array command. Now, the particle array is only used on the V9K, as you can see by this definition here. So what this does is it sets up a star array, which is going to appear on screen but not hurt the player. Now, there is some rather tricky code here, and what this is doing is the stars will naturally fall down the screen, unlike other stars that only go outwards towards their own direction. Particles actually drop by themselves in a kind of firework effect, but immediately after a burst occurs, they will all fly up again to try and give the appearance of a bursting out and then a, a descending. So that's what this code is doing here. And ticks occurred is the um, current tick of the world game. And we can use this to have events every tick, every other tick. And this is as every fourth tick that this counter is running. So that's how that is working. Now, as you can see here, we've got some modifying code for the player star array. This is the player's bullets. The bullets of the enemy on the spectrum are very large, but for the player, that would have made the screen confusing. So we're using an alternate version of the drawing code on the spectrum for the player's bullets here. So that's being modified in. And then we're selecting the player's color. 
On the V9K, we're using a sprite, but on all of the systems, we're actually modifying the byte data of the screen, so we're not technically using a sprite on those other systems. So for player bullets, we don't want to detect collisions with the player, so we're disabling it with this code here. Then we're loading in the size of this player's star array, which is 128, and the pointer to the memory, which is fixed on this system. We've got some more code for the V9K here. We need to be able to modify the speed of the stars on the, on the Turbo R. Because the Turbo R is so fast, everything has to be slowed down. So that's what that code's doing there. And then this is jumping into the start of the drawing routine. Here's some code to initialize the colors. So this allows us to select the sprite, and this is for custom bullets. On the V9K, the bullets were little bones on the um, Scalder sprite. And on Chibi Akuma's episode two, the anti-vampire machine, the bullets change colors at the different stages. So that was uh, used to change the enemy bullets. And also it can be used to change the player bullets as well. So here's the main redraw sequence. First, we want to check if the game is paused. Uh, the game is paused if text occurs is zero. So we're just checking that here. And then we're using, this is for the, the enemy bullets. So we're using the big star here, which is the Spectrum's very large sprite for the enemy bullets. Now we want to load in the enemy star away size, which is 255. And then we start with the enemy colors. Now at this point, we need to load in the actual position of the sprites of the bullets on the V9K. Because the V9K has two bullet sprites, we alternate between the two to give some basic animation. Our next stage here is if we're going to detect hits on the player, then what we want to do is we want to pre-work out the hitbox of the player, and then we're going to use self-modifying code to put those values of the size of the hitbox straight into the comparisons with the current position of the bullet. This saves a lot of time because we don't have to repeatedly read in the player's attributes. So here we're getting player one's X position, and this is player one's Y position, and we're just storing those in these values here, and then we're doing the same for player two here. Now at this point, we're actually at the point where we're able to start processing the stars. Now on the V9K, we're going to be doing sprite operations, so we preset up things to do that. Next, we're putting in our self-modifying code here, because this will be modified on the Turbo R to slow things down. Here's what we call a marker. The, the star array, if the, if the enemies are firing too fast, the star array will, will become full. And rather than scan the star array to find if there's any empty slots and find there aren't over and over again, what we do is if we found the star array was full, we mark it as full using this marker. And we don't look again until the, the screen's been redrawn once because it's just a waste of time. And it was causing um, nasty pauses in the game code when there were a lot of bullets on the screen. So that was a, a fix that I did to stop unnecessary scanning of the star array when we've already worked out that it's full. Here is the code where we actually start reading in from the star array's Y positions. And then once we've read in at the Y position here, if it's zero, then we're just going to continue and loop around again here because until we find one with a Y value that's not zero, we've not found a living star. And so we're just going to keep searching through. And as I said before, to move to the next position within that, we don't need to ink HL, we just need to ink L because of that aligned data. So we're basically scanning through here the Y coordinates, but then when we find a living one, we will jump down to the X coordinates as well, and then down one again to the move, and then we can move up again to get back to our original position. So we're just using ink commands rather than any kind of multiplication or addition. So we will jump to found one here once we find a living star. There's some code here to kill a star, which is again, as I said, just a case of setting the Y coordinate to zero here. When we found a living star, we want to load C with the value we just read in, because that's the Y position. We load B with the X position, and we load D with the move. And you'll see we only need to ink H each time to move to those different attributes, rather than any kind of multiplication or any kind of lookups. So that's very fast. Now what we've got here is a simplified version of the do moves command that we looked at the other week. So we're not going to look at it again because it's it, it's exactly the same code. The only reason it's in here again is because it's saving a call command to jump to that other version. And this version is simplified because it can't do the advanced moves and the top bit that has a value of 128 bit 7 is actually used for an alternate purpose by stars. Enemy objects need to know which player shot them so that if a coin is generated, it flies towards the player that actually killed the enemy. And that bit is used to denote the player that shot the bullet. At this point, we're just checking if the star is dead, because if the star has gone off the screen, we need to remove it. And now we're going to do our player collision detections. 
Now, I said before we were using self-modifying code to write in comparisons, and they're all going to end up in here. And so rather than actually reading in the player's position or anything like that, we don't need to because we've already got them in here, and we're just comparing them to C and B to see if the star is within the hitbox of player 1 or player 2. And if they are, then we go to the correct injury commands here. But they could be self-modified out if the these are bullets of the player or particles. So you can see here we've got the ability to scan for the hitbox relatively quickly without loading in any of the data. So at this point, we're storing the data back into the array. Now maybe the, the position's changed, maybe the star's dead. We're just having to decrease H twice to get back to the original Y location that we started in. And now we're actually in a position to start drawing the star. So we need to alter the position that we read in, in some cases, because of the size of the bullets do vary depending on the system. And then we get to this, which is the real crux of the drawing code. This is a specific piece of code that will draw the star on each one of our systems. And we're going to have a look at that in just a moment. Now here you can see we're popping back some values and we're jumping back up to the start to repeat the whole procedure again. So let's have a look at the Amstrad CPC version of the star drawing code. Of course, the Amstrad CPC version of Chibi Akamas was the first, so the other versions were based on it. So here we've got the code that actually starts drawing the sprite, and you'll see there isn't very much of it. Remember, there's no sprites. This is more like a compiled sprite. This is code that creates the byte appearance of the object on the screen, so it knows what the Amstrad CPC screen is, how it works, and how to make a star on it. A star, of course, is just a 2 by 2 pixel square. I'm calling it a star. It's just a block, really. So here is a self-modifying piece of code that will load the screen position, which is either C000 or A000. But we only need the top byte here. So this will be self-modified into the correct location. Then we load our address table, which is a list of all of the line numbers based on that offset. So we will just need to add the data in the address table to the offset, and that will give us the Y position of our line. We still need to get the X position, which will be the byte number, but we'll do that in just a moment. So here we've got B loaded with the address here, and then we're loading in C with the byte position across the screen. We're doing a one rotate to the right, because if you remember, our screen coordinates go up to 160 units, but our screen is only 80 bytes across, and we have to work in bytes for speed here. So we're just lopping off one bit here so that we've got a byte value in C, and B already had our screen memory address. So adding this to a, a, a line from the address table will give us the byte position of the star on our screen. What we now do is we load in two consecutive lines, because our star is two pixels tall. This saves us having to do any extra calculations to move down a line. Now, at this point, we're adding BC to HL, and what that's doing is that's setting HL to the correct memory location in X and Y terms of the byte that is the first line of the star that we're going to draw to the screen. We now know the exact position, and we just need to draw the star to the screen. Now, you'll notice here we did a bit 0, a just before removing that bit here, and that's because the last bit of our screen coordinate, because the screen is only 80 bytes wide but our coordinates are 160 coordinates, we need to take that one bit and we need to actually draw the star differently depending on what that bit is. Now none of these commands here will alter the Z flag, so when we do a jump Z here, we're actually applying it based on this command here. Again, this is an optimization. And what this is doing is there's two versions of the star drawing code, depending on whether the star is on the right hand of the byte or the left hand of the byte, because it's too slow to do pixel shifting. So we actually have two versions of the code here. And what we're doing is we're used doing an AND command to remove the two pixels we want to draw the star into, but keep the two pixels of the background, which we've read in from the current memory location here. We're then alling in the color of our star, storing it back, and then what we're doing is we're getting that second line of the screen table that we read in here, re-adding BC, which is still our screen buffer location and our X offset. And now this is the second line of the star. We're doing a bit of a cheat, though. We really, if we were going to be precise, we should load back in the background, clear off the two pixels of the star, and write the two pixels of the new color of the star, and then write it back again. I'm not doing that and it's intentional because I'm saving a few bytes. I'm taking the assumption that the lower line is probably the same or almost identical to the top line of the star because the star is only two pixels tall. So I'm effectively corrupting part of the background, but I'm only corrupting two pixels. So it's not going to be the end of the world. And it means I'm saving all of these commands here. 
I don't have to reread an A. I don't read in, do an and or an or again. I just write back the exact same byte I wrote here. So I'm saving all those commands. So this is the entire drawing code of the start on the Amstrad CPC. So you'll see there's no sprite. There's no sprite commands. It's far too fast for that. You can't do that kind of command this many times and expect the game to be fast enough. So that's the Amstrad CPC version. So let's take a look at the Spectrum version. OK, so the Spectrum version is in theory the same. However, we've had to make some changes. Because the star is now six pixels tall, the code is a lot more complicated and things that worked well on the Amstrad CPC no longer work at all. We can't load in six lines from the address table because we just don't have enough registers to do that. So we're having to load them in one by one later. And also things like doing that bit test to detect our location. That's not going to work either because on the ZX Spectrum, there are eight pixels to a byte, whereas on the Amstrad CPC, there were only four. So we're actually having to have four different versions of the star drawing code to cope with that one byte per eight pixel limitation of the Spectrum screen. So here's our self-modifying code. We'll either use the big star for enemy bullets or the small star for player bullets. And then we're loading in our screen position here again, but then things get different. So at this point, what we're doing is we're working out the screen location that we want to read from the address table, and then we're reading in that address line. Now we need to jump to one of our four star drawing routines, but they're all basically the same, so we'll just look at one. The procedure is basically the same as the Amstrad, it's just not as efficient. We load in a line from the address table, we add our offset, which is the X byte offset and the screen position offset in memory, and of course our address table is the Y position effectively. And then what we're doing is we're blanking out part of the background and then awing in the, the colours of our star. But you'll see there's an awful lot more code here, and the reason for that is not only is the star taller, but it's also wider and it can often go over a single byte boundary. If it's halfway across a byte, it has to go into a neighboring byte. So there's a lot more reading and writing and modifying of the background here. So that's why the spectrum stars are harder to draw. But the thing is the spectrum screen takes half the memory of the Amstrad. So the spectrum version is about the same speed or arguably even faster than the Amstrad CPC. That's just because of the lack of color information in the, in the spectrum and it's only got that 8K screen to the CPC 16. And then once we get down here, we jump to the next star. The, each version of this is just the same basic thing. It's just handling all four potential offsets within the one byte of the spectrum screen here. And then if we get down here, we've got a miniature version, which uses a much smaller star, which I think is only, it's only four lines tall. So it, it's much smaller. Um, it's, the player doesn't really need to see their own bullet so much. They need to see the enemy ones to be able to dodge them, but the player ones are much smaller and much simpler. So that's how we draw them on the spectrum. It's, as I say, it's essentially the same code. It's just more complex to get around the spectrum limitations. Now let's have a look at the MSX version. So the MSX version, if we're not using the V9K, again, writes to the byte memory of the screen, but the screen memory on the MSX isn't directly addressable with writing commands loading into memory, so we have to use out commands. And what we have to do is we have to set the VDP and we have to tell it what memory address we want to write to, and then we do that here after calculating the correct memory address with these commands here. Now, once we've got to this point, we do actually have the correct memory location of the star. And then all we need to do is write the data to the screen here. Now, ironically on the MSX, because the screen is four bits per pixel, our, our star is actually using an entire byte. So there's no worry about reading data in and writing it out and overwriting bits of the background. That's actually something that the MSX makes a lot easier for us. But we do have to do all of these commands twice to load the, the, the next memory location that we want to read in here, because there's no way to just do it automatically, unfortunately. And we do just all in a one here, which is to, to offset the memory location to move us down one line to get the memory that the second line of the star will overwrite. And that's all we need to do. It's really quite straightforward. And the advantage of doing this direct memory writing is we don't have to worry about if the VDP is doing something else. If the VDP is drawing a sprite and we want to draw another sprite, we have to wait for it. But we can write to the memory like this anytime we want. And if the VDP is still drawing another sprite, we won't cause it any trouble. Now on the V9K, we are going to be a bit cleverer or ironically, a bit simpler. We're gonna get it to draw a sprite. Now we had the definition of what we were gonna draw it just here, and we'll be modifying in the memory location of the sprites within the VDP's memory that we're gonna use for our stars later. So when it comes to this point here, 
all we need to do is update the X and Y position of the sprite we want to draw. And then we just need to load in the address of that data we just saw, which is the definition. And then we select the register we want to start writing from, which is 32. I'm doing some of the tutorials on the V9K, so don't worry about it if you don't understand these. But uh, we need to set a bunch of the registers to tell it what to do. And then these are the binary code of out i commands. EDA3 is an out i command. And so we're doing lots and lots of out i commands here. It's just neater to have them as byte data rather than a big long stream of them. And then what we do is we do this last command, which is select register 52, which is the command register. And then we send the draw, effectively the draw sprite command, which is copying a block of VRAM to VRAM. And the block it's copying from is the sprite definition. And the block it's copying to is the visible screen memory. So that's how we draw the stars to the screen. You can see there's no real sprites on any of the systems with it except for the MSX V9K. And as I say, that's that's really the trick of getting it to the screen fast enough. You just you got to strip it down to the absolute minimum you can get the, to do the job. And so there we go. Now I'm not going to show you any usage of this code today because you never actually use this code directly. You can create an enemy that fires stars, but you never actually create stars themselves because the other code does that for us. So we're going to leave that here at this point. Now, next week, we're going to have a look at something else. We're probably going to start looking at the object array, which is what handles the enemies and the background sprites moving around the screen. I hope you've enjoyed this week's lesson. If you have, please like and subscribe. But anyway, thanks for watching and goodbye.